Okay, so I guess we will get started. Um, hello, my name is John Lakos, and I'm going to be talking about memory allocators. Uh, and I guess you're all here to figure out if they're really worth the trouble, so uh, let's get started. Um, I don't have my normal six or 700 slides. It's down to barely over 400, so this should go fairly quickly, I hope. Um, this is the copyright notice that I have to put up, but you don't need to read it. Um, this is the abstract, but you're already here, so it's done its job. Um, so <clears throat> these are some important recurring questions, and I hope that they're near and dear to your hearts, because I've certainly heard them enough times when I've been out and about, uh, and it's very, uh, it, it becomes quite a challenge to uh, give a talk like this one to every single person that has a question. And especially if you don't have the slides, it's tough. So the slides, I hope, will go a long way to uh, uh, facilitating my ability to explain it. And I want you to know that writing the slides went a long way to facilitating my ability to explain it. So uh, it was a really good exercise for me. And I think it'll get better as I continue uh, to, to give the talk. This is certainly the first time I've ever given the talk in this form. Two days ago, I tried to dry run it at my company and I failed miserably. I went over by 70 minutes. So I cut out like 300 slides. Um, it's really quite embarrassing. It will get better. It can't, couldn't get worse. I mean, it was a great talk, but it wasn't about what I was trying to talk about. It was uh, all nothing else. All right, so here's the outline. Let me just explain the goal. If I'm successful, I'll give you a little bit of background that's relevant as opposed to everything I know. Then the second thing is I'm going to explain what the problem is. It's always good to know what the problem is. Then, if we make it to three, I'm going to show you some benchmarks and data. And then, when we get to four, we'll have some conclusions. There'll be a short quiz, and then you guys can all leave. How's that? OK, good. <clears throat> so introduction and background. Here's a tough question. Why do we like the C++ language? OK. <laughs> or we don't. OK, so here are some things that, that we might like about C++. Why do or should we care about memory allocators? They're similar. And uh, this is really true. So what are the benefits? Well, not all memory is alike. There are other qualitative benefits, like testing and debugging memory. I know we have to do that, so. Uh, and, oh yes, sometimes you can get enhanced runtime performance. Notice that there are three things going on here. Not one, but three. But I'm pretty sure you guys came for the third one, because the first two you all know, of course, they're very convenient and useful, and, and we can put things in different places, so it's not that. It's just performance. So let me tell you, back in 1977, when I was at Bear Stearns, there was a fellow who wanted to speed up his program. And his program basically creates something, creates a data structure, uses it like crazy, and then deletes it. That's his model. And he does that over and over and over. And it turns out back then we had something called a coalescing allocator. And while it would allocate very quickly, when it went to give back the memory, it was horribly slow. So when he would destroy his object, because he planned to do this again, um, it took uh, like 10 seconds, I mean, to delete the, the system, and that was just ridiculous. And so uh, we just gave him an arena allocator in the, in the object that he was using, and instead of being 10 seconds, it didn't sh the destruction didn't show up in Purify at all. So 10 seconds to zero. That's, that's a fairly good improvement, right? So that's just example number one. Then I went to Bloomberg, and this very same model from 1997 turned out to be exactly what the doctor ordered for mapping in-core, that's how old I am, in-core memory to, to disk via uh, 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 this, this thing called a save range. Anyway, very proprietary. No one should know about it. But this is how one of the technologies we used bef way back, I mean, Bloomberg had the internet before there was the internet. And we had this thing before there were other things. And this thing works. And this is how we've been very successful. But the trick is you have to be able to save an STD vector to disk and then bring it back in. And to do that, you have to put the vector memory 
in a particular place. And the way you do that is with allocators. Otherwise, you can't do that, period, full stop. All right, then in 2006, people started going, oh, look at this. If I do this, it's faster. Oh, I did it again, it's faster. Oh, and now it's like an addiction. It's like substance abuse with, with allocators. Now, if you don't have an allocator, you're not happy. You must use an allocator. Allocators are pervasive throughout Bloomberg. So there are people that use them, right? They're addicted to them. There must be some reason. So we're going to try to find out why. Uh, unfortunately, there are the naysayers that, there's some common arguments against, why would we not want allocators? Given what I just said, can't we all go home? We're done, it's good. Why wouldn't you want an allocator? Somebody tell me. Speak loudly, be bold. Why wouldn't we want it? Go ahead. Complexity. This is a very good point. In fact, one of the things I'll bring up. So it requires more upfront design. And as software engineers, we can't be bothered with that, right? We just need to code as quickly and as much as possible. And design is highly overrated. OK, another one. Misuse, OK? Did you look at my slides? So it complicates the interface. Certainly it does, because now you have the option of telling the object where to go. That's a nice thing, do you? Object, go there. You don't have to. If you don't say anything, it'll go wherever it wants to. But if you wanted to go over there, you can say that. Um, how about for the great majority of you who will never use an allocator to save yourselves, it's going to slow you down. Oh, there's all this extra stuff. It's more code. More code runs slower. Ah, it's all crap. I don't need it. Anybody believe that? Yes? Another one? Who is that guy? All right, I'll buy you a drink later. Uh, all right, so maybe we don't need a special allocator. Is it ever possible to write a C++ program without a custom local allocator? Anybody think so? You're all right. Um, and maybe you get the wrong one. What if I pick the wrong allocator? The, whole, the code might not work. That'd be horrible. OK, so these are all valid concerns. We're going to address them with well-supported facts and careful measurement. Sound good? OK, what is main memory? Now, I have, to, in full disclosure, I spent a lot of time trying to optimize this talk so that I could communicate information. So here we have main memory and a CPU. But when I started, I was a little, you know how you procrastinate a little bit when you get started? So this is my CPU's uh, uh, actual, the, the, the core, the thing that does the thinking. And I had so much time on my hands back about three weeks ago when I started this that I actually figured out how to make this, see the shades? I don't know if you can see, but there's actually texture. And that's from the wear of that wheel turning. You don't see it yet, but it's going to turn. <laughs> and this is main memory. What we're going to do is we're going to start up our CPU, and we're going we're to actually put some things in main memory. Watch this. See it? And look, we're accessing main memory. You think I'm kidding? You know how maddeningly tedious it is to do this? I swear. <laughs> all right. So then I realized I don't have all the time in the world, so this CPU doesn't work. This one's broken. I'll fix it later. Just take my word for it. But we do have a cache. So here's our broken CPU, which doesn't work, and, uh, or it's going so fast right now you can't see it spin. And we're going to access the same things. And when we access main memory, we get what's called a cache line. And that cache line, the whole thing, about eight things, comes in. Now, this is the ultimate oversimplification of computer hardware. I don't care. Because if I tried to explain that to you, we would never get to the talk. I don't even know it. So it would even be worse, right? But this I know. This is something we should all know. So when I access something else, we get a new cache line, and it goes into the cache. The good thing about cache lines is, is that if you have memory that's local to other memory that's just been fetched, you get it instantly. So notice how this comes straight into cache, figuratively, because it was already there, right? And now, when you access something nearby, life is good. The green indicates we're going to do it right. When you write, you write it back to main memory, and maybe the cache line goes away. And then you access something else in a different place, and the uh, cache line comes in, and it can reuse the other cache line. Does this make sense? This is actually important. Does anybody believe this is not important? 
If not, that you're not at the right talk because this is important. And in fact, I'm gonna point out something to you. Notice that there are eight of these. That's a magic number. Eight is a magic number. We're gonna see where eight shows itself. It's very exciting. In fact, I realized this as I was waking up after my four hours sleep, <clears throat> that this may explain one phenomena. But anyway, not, I mean, the end result is, there's no disputing the end result, it's the why. The exact why, what is it that's happening here? So I have a suspicion. So everybody knows this stuff, but I put it up anyway. Main memory segments, we have an executable program. We load it into main memory, and it's a fixed size chunk. And then we have stack memory. <sighs> grows down, it doesn't have to, it could grow up. And then we have dynamic memory, and it grows up. So this is what we have to work with. Notice that there are different kinds of memory. For the case that I described where we were doing memory mapped I.O., we were using the static data segment to put the memory there. That's important. We put it in a specific place. What is a memory allocator? All right, so C language memory allocation. We have general purpose allocator called malloc. We've heard of that. It's a utility. I use the term utility to mean a bunch of functions in a header file. We also have this thing called alloc A, and it's a special purpose local allocator. It's very special because it doesn't have a delete. It doesn't have any way to get rid of the memory specifically, but we all know it's coming from the stack, whereas that's coming from dynamic memory, and when the stack goes away, the memory's just gone. And in fact, it's exactly that allocator that I wrote in C++ in 1997 that made the 10 seconds go to zero. I didn't know it was this. I mean, you know, there's the thing, you sort of rediscover things if you don't know about them. This has been known forever. Who, whoever created alloc A knew what they were doing. For real. Okay, I made this up. You may not like it. Memory allocator organizes a region of computer memory, dispensing and reclaiming authorized access to suitable subregions on demand. A lot of words. I, I don't even know if it's grammatically correct, but that's what I'm calling it. You get the idea. Um, so we have a general purpose allocator, we have a special purpose allocator, and I'm just putting up here, general purpose allocator works reasonably well all the time, satisfies all the requirements. A special purpose allocator might not work, might not satisfy all the requirements, but in some cases it's going to kick butt. So that's when you use it, when you know that that's gonna happen, okay? So we have a global allocator, and a global allocator, I can, I can get it from anywhere. I don't need to pass around its address because it's the default allocator. If I don't say anything, it's coming from that thing. But if I want memory to come from somewhere else, I need to be holding on to something that knows where that memory is. So I'm holding on to a pointer. I must. So in order to incorporate these allocators, the standard was forced to consider the case when you have a non-default allocator, you must hold its pointer. Then the original 1998 standard just said, eh, whatever, that was a bad idea. The 98 standard is not sufficient. Now, if you have a conforming C++ 11 compiler, it's still 98 conforming, except for whatever little breaks they made. That's okay, it's just that there were weasel words in the standard that said, yeah, my implementation won't work for you and your code will all break. That's no longer the case. That is absolutely not the case. All right, so in C++, we saw in C we have malloc, in C++ we have new, right? So I put this slide up so you guys get an idea of we can have a global general purpose allocator like malloc, or we can have a local special purpose allocator like alloc A, and we can have things on either side. So I'm putting this up here for you to get a taste. Make sense? Memory allocator is a stateful utility or mechanism. Mechanism is my word for an instantiable object that does not try to represent a value. I had 300 slides on that topic that I deleted. Not kidding. Be more. not kidding. This is the slide I deleted last night because of mania. So I put it back in. What does a local allocator do? It's sitting over here and it accesses a 
tiny subregion. Now, one thing that I realize is very hard to imagine, subregions have two dimensions. There's physical dimension, so it's some area, and there's a temporal dimension, which means for some part of the duration of the program. So you think about this two-dimensional grid, if you will, where you have some section of memory, that local arena might last for just uh, 50 milliseconds, and it's gone. And then some other thing comes along. It's kind of like a cache. Okay. So what is a local? We like to look at code. So I wrote some code. And I want to again thank Deepmar, because he helped me compile a lot of this code in real time last night at the bar. And I had a lot of bugs. So uh, thank you, Deepmar. <sighs> OK. Where was I? Uh, so we have this, this local allocator mechanism. And one of the things you should note that we need to be able to create the local allocator with something. If we don't, there may be some default something that goes on where we get some memory from somewhere. But often, you want to create a local allocator associated with a particular region. So I put that just to uh, obscure it. Begin, end, maybe. But it's not required that you have a default um, a constructor for, for an allocator in order for it to be standard compliant. That's not required. So we do need allocate and deallocate. And something that's very important about local allocators only is that you don't need to destroy your objects anymore. You can ask the allocator to do it. Anybody worried? Now destruction is free. What do you think? This is scary stuff, right? Now, if you're a uh, games developer, I hear you have the addiction very bad. Like, you, you can't operate without allocators. I hear this. But the same is true at Bloomberg. If you're trying to get something done and done quickly, um, it'll turn out that without allocators, it won't be as quick. Just won't, because we have big processes, and they're time multiplexed. And when I go into a subregion, which includes space and time, I'm going to be hitting that subregion a lot. Do I want my memory together, or do I want my memory dispersed? Together. Does everybody know why? Think about why. Cache line. So when I access something, it comes in. I access the next thing, it's already there. Otherwise, I access something, I have one thing. I access something else, I have one thing. Now, this is the key observation. Suppose I have a subsystem that fits in L1 cache. All the memory fits there, right? If it's compact. But suppose it's diffuse, and every cache line holds only one datum instead of eight. I can hold a subsystem only one-eighth the size. Eight is a magic number. So how many people have heard of the term fragmentation? OK. Does anybody feel very brave and want to tell me what fragmentation means? Somebody. No? Memory pools. Okay, memory pools is not fragmentation. Memory holes. Okay, that's better. And you were going to say? All right. So, so think about this. Suppose I have a good chunk of memory, and I start allocating and freeing and allocating and freeing. And clearly, over time, there will some holes will occur. And now, eventually, I want to access a big chunk of memory. Let's say it's on the order of 10% of all memory. I may have 60% of memory available and no contiguous block of 10% of my memory, right? I fail. Well, that's bad, right? I don't want to do that. Now, it turns out that that was back in the day, long time ago, when we had coalescing allocators and we had uh, limits on how much we could address and whatever. That's not really a problem anymore. Now, here's a new term. It's called diffusion. And uh, regrettably, at 5.30 in the morning, I didn't draw a slide that's going to probably take me an entire day to show you how memory diffuses throughout, like individual little dots going around. Because what happens is if I have one of our experiments, this is the second experiment, I'm going to take an element off of a linked list and put it somewhere else. And everybody here, I'm sure, loves the idea that you can move the element, which means that the address doesn't change, but now I'm accessing 
from one cash line to the other. And everybody's going, wow, I saved myself. I don't have this. I can do a move instead of a copy. You're killing yourselves. You're killing yourselves. Don't do that. It's so wrong. It's so misguided. My children. All right. <laughs> a, mem a memory allocator is the client-facing interface four. A stateful utility or mechanism that organizes a region, possibly non-contiguous, uh, of, of, mem of, of computer memory dispensing and reclaiming authorized, means you're allowed to do it, access to suitable subregions on demand. This is what a memory allocator is, and this is what you all thought it was when you came in, I trust. We can supply them in mul multiple ways. One of the ways we can supply them is with utilities like malloc and free, but that does not support allocator objects. That's for global allocators. We can use what's, what I call a reference wrapper, and for lack of 300 more slides, I'm just gonna tell you that we have this thing called a wrapper, and if I have a mechanism that allocates memory, I can take the address of that mechanism, and as long as it has allocate, alloc and dealloc, allocate and deallocate, this thing will act like a proxy for a local allocator, satisfying the allocator concept. Now remember, the mechanism is not part of the object. It's the wrapper, which is just a pointer. It's not even a reference. It's a pointer to something else, okay? That's there. It's a real thing. If anybody thinks you can copy an alligator, does anybody think you can copy an alligator? Get over yourselves. You cannot copy the alligator. The alligator is, uh, is, 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 an, is an identity. It's referring to memory, which is unique in your program. And all you can do is copy its address. So again, if you think, oh, I'm gonna put the allocator in the object, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, none, zero. So dismiss that from your mind. That can't happen. So what's good about this is uh, uh, the, the concrete allocator type is available for use by, by the client's compiler. This is one of the things people really like because if I do this, then, then uh, my, my container can be viewed by the uh, client's compiler, and this allocator can be viewed because it's part of the type. Everything is known in compile time. So I can go in, and I don't have to worry about any of these nasty overhead things like function calls and whatever, because as we all know, templates are the fastest thing possible, and nothing else matters. Nothing. Right? OK. Unfortunately, there are some problems with making everything a template, like you don't have .o files. That is a problem, and it also it also makes it very hard to, to interact with, with other things if you don't have a template. So for example, if I have a non-template thing like Beeman Dawes' file system, and I've got something called path name, and I want to give it an allocator because it allocates memory, well, I have to make it a template, and that's nuts. So we're not doing that. As the address of a pure abstract base class, now we're going back, technology, 20 years, back to when an abstract base class was a good thing instead of poison. You can hold an allocator by its abstract base class and use it polymorphically. What a crazy idea. Um, the choice of allocator does not affect the C++ type. So now when I give something a new allocator, whatever that something is, it behaves much more like a shared pointer, which holds a deleter, than it does a C++ 98 container like vector, where now it's a vector of my allocator, which is not the same as a vector of your allocator, and they're incompatible unless the client is a template. Bad, okay. Allocators must be accessed via the virtual function mechanism. Okay, and now we have to cart around an extra pointer. Okay, question, if I were to make std vector cart around an extra pointer, what would its footprint be in the number of words on the machine? Yes? No. Anybody else? The answer is no, whatever you say. It could be a short vector optimization and it could be this big, or it could be one word, or anything in between, because what you can do is you can encode the information and then store it in the allocated memory once the memory is allocated. So anybody that tells you, oh, we're going to make the footprint go up by 33%, Sun doesn't have a footprint of three, by the way. Sun had a footprint of one. Okay? So these are the kind of arguments. 
that really define FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. People say these things and then they're done, they have their drink, yay. Nonsense, it's all nonsense. All right, we got through that. Now last time it took me 80 minutes to get through that. Deepmar, I'm doing better, right? A little bit, okay, Deepmar's my coach. He's really doing a good job. Uh, so here's the problem. I wanna know if I should supply an allocator. Uh, if the answer is no, I'm done. Cheers. The answer is yes. Do I want to supply it via a base class or do I want to invade the type of the object with a template parameter? Either way, I have to figure out what allocator mechanism I want to supply by either of these two things. And then I have to decide whether I want to actually delete every stinking element in my container or say, I don't care. Just get rid of them. Now you could say, no, 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 that's not good. But then you don't care about performance, so it's fine. You do what you want. If you want to go delete a whole bunch of things separately, it's like picking up each piece of dust with your fingers instead of getting a broom. All right. So this is what we have to solve. If we knew the answer to this, we really would be done. How can we find the answer to this? How would you find the answer to this? What would you do? Thoughts? All right, we'll think about that. So, there's one global allocator. There are two ways to access it. We can access it via type parameter, we can access it via virtual uh, function. There's two different allocation strategies. So, two global strategies. Then, there are three kinds of local strategies. We'll explain what they are later, just placeholder. Monotonic, multi-pool, and look at that, multi-pool of monotonic. It doesn't really do that, but it's so expressive. I love it. Okay, so that's what it is. So I've got three different allocation, general allocation strategies, and I can access those mechanisms via either a type parameter or an abstract base class. And I can do normal destruction, or I can wink it out, that's 12. You add them up, there are 14 allocation strategies. When I originally tried to do this, I had names for each of the 14 allocation strategies. And Deepmar rightly tried to uh, suggest that I encode what the meaning of this is in the name. And it turns out that when we tried to do that, we had no idea what we were talking about. We really needed to give an ID to the allocation strategy and then everything became clear. So it turns out global allocator, Allocation strategy one. New delete allocator accessed through a abstract base class allocation strategy two, and so on. We'll see how that works. Here are the 14 allocation strategies. They are really easy to read, right? You can just look at this chart and say, it's all good. No one believes it, right? So let's go on. Here's allocation strategy one, and it's that beautiful default allocator, and this is slides from last night because I wanted to make this clear. And this is the kind of thing that an, uh, the global allocator is. It's got some of this stuff. I put some code here because I can't possibly explain everything in the time that I have. So I put some code here. You can look at this. You get the idea. If anybody sees any typos, jlakos at bloomberg.net. Now I'm in trouble. This is a standard allocator, OK? Notice it has allocate and deallocate. The default constructor, it's not required by the allocator concept, but it does happen to be there. Uh, it's implemented in terms of new and delete. And again, standard allocator, allocation strategy one. Okay? Now, we can do it via a type parameter. What does that mean? That means that, right? That's the default allocator for a vector. I could also do it explicitly, like that. You understand what I mean between passing it as a type parameter and passing it via a virtual function? Do you, yes, no? Anybody still, well, we're gonna try, we're gonna really try. This is a type parameter. Now, normal destruction. If you have a global allocator, there's nothing to do. You just do what you do, don't worry about it. We'll get to local allocators in a second. So here's a benchmark. Um, I've got a system, when it goes out of scope, goes away, right? Now I'm going to populate the system with individual elements allocated using new. Then I'm gonna do some access. 
This is benchmark two, by the way, sort of. This is benchmark one. This is all the benchmarks. And then I'm going to get rid of it. Normal destruction. This is what we do. Does everybody understand? Right? Create it. Beat on it. Get rid of it. Yeah? Okay. Now, let's look at AS2. AS2 is the same thing, but now we're going to deal with it as a protocol. So this is the abstract base class. Has allocate and deallocate. They're pure abstract. Then we have the new delete allocator, which is a kind of allocator. Notice the uppercase A. And... It has allocate and deallocate. It overrides the, uh, the base class. Does this make sense? Does this make concrete what I'm talking about? Does anybody think that this is all theoretical? This is real stuff. DeepMark compiled it in his head, so it's, it's good. OK. All right, this is allocation strategy two. <sighs> Next, it is accessed by an abstract base class. So here's how you access it. You create the new delete allocator and you pass it in. Notice that the type of vector here is vector of int. Now, in C11, you can't do that, but in C17, you can, sort of, like this. That's cool, right? You actually can do this. All right, this is via protocol. How many of you people right now are saying, I can't believe they did that? Now there are two ways to pass an allocator. Now one wasn't good enough, now we have two. Oh my goodness, what is the world coming to? C++ is completely overrated. Get rid of it. Okay. Well, yes, question. Yeah, where do you want me to go? Yeah. OK, so we have a comment. First of all, let me point out, the comment is we have, and thank you for pointing that out. The comment is that we have used inline in a derived class. This is a trick interview question. It used to be purely academic. The question is, is it possible to inline a virtual function ever? And the answer is yes. Under what circumstances can you inline a virtual function? By the way, that's why I made it red. I didn't make it red because it was bad. I made it red because it was good. You can inline a virtual function if the compiler knows the runtime type of the object. How could that happen? Static binding, yes. Local variable. If it can see that it is this, like right here. Wait, look at this. Seriously, the compiler knows exactly what type the object is. Some people think that this is slower than invading the type. Some people don't think you can inline virtual functions. There are a lot of things that people think that aren't true. They think it must be true. I thought it. It's not true. OK, but if I don't do that, if I don't make it inline, I'm giving up performance, potentially. All right, I don't want to do that. All right, where did I get to? I'm sorry. Did I go? To, I, I got a little lost here. So normal destruction, same thing. New delete allocator. We got to do the benchmark. Get rid of it. And I have a bug because you see that slide thing. It, it winked at me. No, I did that on purpose last night. I remember. I wanted it to wink at me. To remind me that I actually did the normal thing. I even remember thinking that last night. All right. So now we're going to look at our first local allocation. Yes. OK, the question is, isn't it implicitly inlined? Yes, it is. Have you ever been to a talk where people inline things they shouldn't because the slide is, makes it easier? Hence, I put the word inline in and made it red. OK. You know, when I've had sleep, I'll really give a good talk, but I'm doing the best I can. Forgive me. All of these are monotonic, all of these strategies. We don't know what monotonic is, but it's awesome. All right, let me tell you what it is. The monotonic allocator defaults or, or passes. The monotonic allocator, when it runs out of memory, goes and gets more memory from the global allocator. This is called allocator chaining. So here's a local allocator. And what it does is you give it 
this particular one. This is our particular allocator. It's called buffered sequential allocator. All of this stuff is available at GitHub. You can go get it and use it right now. But the idea is you give it a buffer. Normally, it's a buffer on the stack. And what it does is it peels off memory for you on the stack. It just gives you, you ask for it, you ask for it, you ask for it, it gives it to you. If it overflows the buffer, it allocates more from the heap and just goes into a geometric growth like you would expect, okay? If you try to delete something, it doesn't care. It doesn't spend a second, a microsecond, a nanosecond, a femtosecond caring about it. Maybe it does spend a femtosecond because you have, if you call delete, it does nothing. Hopefully, we can just compile that code out. What happens is when the allocator goes away, the memory is it's gone, just gone. So if it's on the program stack, it is effectively allocate. Okay. Uh, then we can call this thing by a type parameter, or we can call it via an, an abstract, or use it via an abstract base class. So we already saw what that looks like. Let me go to normal destruction. So here's an example, normal destruction. I have this wrapper thing that I told you about. I'm gonna create a type with a wrapper, and I'm trying to do this in sort of the, the um, uh, uh, not magic way. I'm trying to do it less magically. So I've got a buffered sequential allocator, which is a kind of monotonic allocator, satisfies uh, uh, the, the requirements in, in the standard of what a monotonic allocator is. Um, it's, it's a specific implementation of a monotonic allocator. So then I'm gonna allocate for each one of these things, I'm gonna allocate some memory, and then I'm going to new the object in place, and what's getting, what's getting copied, just to be clear, what's getting copied is the pointer is getting constructed into a wrapper. The wrapper is getting copied. In effect, I am copying a pointer. I'm copying an address. I am not copying the buffered sequential allocator. Please, if you leave here with one thing, you cannot copy an allocator. Don't even, it doesn't make any sense at all. It's a region, it's dealing with a region in memory, it's unique. Each local allocator deals with a different uh, arena and duration, right? You don't have two allocators at the same time accessing the same memory. Now I do realize that when you have the stateless default allocator, you copy it all around. You're copying not even a pointer, but we just know it's that one over there. And so effectively all of them are the same. That, that's a horrible, horrible model. And that's what the first talk was about, trying to dissuade you from doing that. Let's not do that. Anyways, so this is normal destruction. What we're doing here is we're, we're, we're um, destroying the object explicitly and then we're deallocating it back to the allocator. Destroy and deallocate. This is something you might give somebody on a low level C++ quiz. How do you do this by hand? This is how you do it. I'm showing it. We don't have to really do this. We can do it better, but I want to show you so there's no, no mistake. Okay, we saw monotonic. Now, this is the magic part. Here, we have this. Now, watch that. I just deleted it. It's gone. It's out. There's no, that code doesn't exist anymore. This is magically winked out code because when the allocator goes out of scope, all of the memory goes away. Somebody's going to have a problem with this. Does anybody have a problem? What's your problem? That's correct. We don't execute. That's the point. We chose not to. It, what if it allocates memory? Well, we got rid of the memory. That's not a problem. What, what does it have to do? It could. But you know what you'd have to do then? You'd have to document that. You'd have to say, this thing manages a file description. Guess what you don't do if you manage a resource other than memory? Guess what you don't do? You don't fail to call the destructors. But what if that's not the case, which is 99% of the time? All right, 90% of the time. Do you see what I'm saying? If you have a special case, then you use a special solution for the special case. Yes? So it turns out that in any real container, they all have the same allocator. Yes, allocators are, are for, and there are reasons for this, believe it or not. Like when you use an algorithm that uses swap on a container, 
you really, really, really don't want to swap unequal allocators because all hell will break loose if you do that. You don't want to copy allocator pointers outside of the scope where they're valid or all hell will break loose. Now, if you don't care about allocators, you can do a lot of crazy things or fun things or whatever. If you care about allocators, there are some constraints that come with it. Some is not a big deal for me, might be a big deal for you, but you can't do everything you want to do when the allocator matters. <sighs> might want to do. I don't, I don't have any problem at all, but again, that's me. So now you see what we have here is we have four monotonic strategies. Two of them are via type parameter, two of them via abstract base class, two of them are by normal destruction, and two of them are by winking out memory. Yes. Yes? Okay, so the question is, we have two things going on. We're destroying the object, and then we're deallocating it. Let me be clear. We're going to choose not to destroy it, because by destroying it, we might free up memory of sub-objects, which we don't want to do. And then we're going to deallocate it, not because we don't need to. OK? So we are not going to destroy it. We are not going to deallocate it. The allocator is going to take care of everything. The object itself, we're not going to destroy it. Just not going to do it. Now. If you allocated, if you have a, a access to a non-memory resource, you're going to have a resource leak. Don't do that. Don't use an allocation strategy that winks out memory if you are holding on to a non-memory resource. Don't do that. OK? Promise? OK. OK. All right, so you get the gist of this. We have monotonic allocators. Then we have multi-pool allocators. What is a multi-pool allocator? It's blue. Multi-pool allocator is basically an array of pointers to pools. And the pool is dynamic. You ask for a link of a, of a given of a chunk of memory of a given size, it gives you one. And then you ask for the same size, and it, it gets two and gives you one. Then it gives you the other. Then you, ask, then you ask for another, the fourth one. It gets four, it gives you one, and so on and so forth. It looks like this. Truth be told, with the new implementation, we don't have a saturation point anymore, but it's just not worth doing this slide again for that. So I'm using it as a placeholder until I have a little more sleep. Uh, so you get the idea. What we're doing here is we have these links, and they hold memory in these sizes. And what's good about this is when you free something, it's not a no-op. When you free it, it goes back. And then you ask for it again, you get it again. So it doesn't waste memory over time, OK? Oversized stuff, stuff that doesn't fit, just goes straight through to the global allocator, OK? So if I ask for a megabyte, this is just, eh. But if I ask for, like, say, um, uh, 130 bytes, it'll give me something maybe of size 132. Make sense? OK. With these, fragmentation becomes less of an issue because most of the memory, the little memory, is chunked. And if you had a really good node-based container, it would have these pools of the right size built in for the nodes, and it would run way faster without an allocator. Hint to, to people who build such things. Our code has it, and using an allocator with our node-based containers isn't impressive. It's a 3% improvement for what it's worth. All right, so we can access it two ways, and we can wink it out or not. And how are we doing on time? All right, I'm halfway through the talk, which I'm myself impressed with, just because there's a lot of material here. Unfortunately, I'm not halfway through the slides. Do you get the idea of what's going on here? There are 14 allocation strategies. There are two global ones. There are 12 local ones. There are three basic mechanisms. And they're accessed each in four ways, either type parameter, 
base class and either de destroyed normally or winked out. That's it. So the last one is a combination. This is a multi-pool allocator backed by a monotonic allocator backed by the global allocator. So it's a composite thing. You can do that with our stuff, no problem. You just create it, what it would look like, and I should probably show this. You, you create the, uh, the, the monotonic allocator first, and then you, you pass in its address to the multi-pool allocator, and now it's just chained. Just really easy. Then you create the vector, for example, and pass in the address of the multi-pool allocator, and it goes through the, it's, it's incredibly easy code. So it's the same deal. You get the idea, right? Those are our allocation strategies. Now, one of the, the next thing is to try to have an architecture independent way of categorizing program size. So, and the number of instructions we execute. It's kind of independent of things. The number of threads. We won't talk about W again until benchmark four. So really all we're talking about is how much work do I have to do? So it's either gonna be the number of instructions or perhaps the number of iterations or perhaps the product of the number of iterations times the number, of, uh, the number of times we repeat the experiment so that we get a manageable size number that we can measure. So imagine I'm doing something. I say, for i equals zero, i less than n plus plus i, do something. And then I do it again, and then I do it again, and then I do it again in different systems. And then I loop over and start again, start that experiment again. I have a product of two things. I have inside the experiment, and I have outside the experiment. And so the product of those becomes the size of the problem, the number of things I have to do. I'll say one more thing. Sometimes we talk about size as system size. Sometimes we talk about size as iteration size. And so physical size and how long I do things. And you can trade them off. If I have, for example, um, four subsystems and, um, uh, and each subsystem is size uh, uh, eight, so four subsystems of size eight or eight subsystems of size four are comparable. So you can imagine trading off on that scale and keeping the overall size constant. In the same way you could imagine trading off the number of iterations by the number of repetitions. If I, do an, if I double the number of iterations, I half the number of repetitions, and the number of instructions executed is comparable. Does that make sense? What we're doing is we're trading off light things so we can see how the different numbers trade off. If you trade them off and it makes no difference, you haven't learned anything. If you trade them off and you go, whoa, that's very different, then you've learned something. Okay. Ah. Oh. All right, so what aspects of, uh, of software are interesting? So this is the part that we wanted to be creative. What do you think is important in software to think about when you're dealing with allocators? Name something. How long it lasts. How long it lasts, okay, that, that's fair. But we use instructions, to, that's, that's kind of like the general one, how, how long does it last? Yeah, long running is an important one. Um, the first one starts with a D. Okay, it's density of allocation operations. Suppose I have a program that doesn't allocate any memory at all. How much good is an allocator gonna do for me? Not much, okay. What if I have a lot of variation in size? Versus I have a node-based container and I have one size, just for thoughts. What if I have the memory really close together or I don't? What if I have a number of subsystems that are multiplexed and I'm jumping to hot spots and I'm here for 50 milliseconds, then I'm over here for 30 milliseconds, then I'm over here. So locality of, of accessed memory is another issue. Utilization, now I'm gonna explain this one now and then later we'll see it, it's benchmark uh, three. Utilization is a measure of how much memory is used at the same time relative to the total amount of memory allocated. There are benchmarks where you allocate all your memory, do some stuff, and get rid of it. Those have high utilization because at one point in time, all the memory you ever allocated is physically resident. You have it. There are other kinds of benchmarks where you go allocate, do something, get rid of it. Allocate, do something, get rid of it. Those have low utilization because you're reusing the same memory over and over. So I might allocate a gigabyte 
and never use more than a K, one K of memory at a time. Low memory utilization, okay? And finally, contention. And if I have a whole bunch of allocators vying for global memory, they can't all have it, so only one will have access and the other ones will be waiting. And, you know, they're not independent things. Um, these are rough indications. This is a mind experiment, right? I'm just trying to get you thinking. I'm trying to get me thinking. We then map them to a scale of zero to one. Don't hold me to this. Zero means it doesn't happen really at all. One means it happens as much as it possibly can, okay? Um, so that's what I just said. Zero is the minimum, one's the maximum. The dimensions are not independent at all. So here's some dimensions. Density, number of allocops over the number of instructions. Zero, no allocation instructions occurred. Number one is everybody's trying to allocate memory. That's all we do. Allocate, deallocate, allocate, deallocate. And I just put this consider STD vector of int. Uh, Frank pointed out, thank you, that some of these examples are a little more complex than I had first thought. So you can think about it. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm not going to say what I said before because it wasn't exactly true. But anyway, if you think about a vector, in this experiment, we pre-allocate the size of the vector up front. So you've got one chunk, of, one chunk of memory, one. Now, that means when I go to allocate the vector, I'm, I'm allocating a chunk and I'm done. There aren't a whole heck of a lot of allocation uh, instructions going on. If I allocate it once, I deallocate it once, and everything in the middle is something else. Very, very low allocation density. Variation, this is pretty straightforward. Everything's the same versus everything's different. Uh, and I said consider this, but uh, you can consider that yourselves. Then locality. This one is far and away the most complex. The number of instructions is in the numerator. The more instructions I'm hitting a region, the more locality I'm getting. The bigger the region, the less locality. So if it's all of the UK and I'm hitting the UK, well, I could be hitting anywhere. But suppose it's this room. I mean, the instructions are coming into this room like crazy, and it's all just us. High locality, okay? So physical locality. Also, the instructions come into this room in a burst, or one instruction comes here, then it goes away, and then another instruction comes here, goes away. Low temporal locality means that I'm breaking away. So this, this is described like this. The, the number of instructions that hits the region is in the numerator, and the size of the memory and the frequency of leaving to go work somewhere else are effectively in the denominator. And so physical locality, we just ignore the temporal part. And for temporal locality, we just ignore the memory part. And you get the different dimensions that we're trying to think about. So, so if I have a, a large subregion, or I, I have a small subregion, but I access, access it just once and then I go somewhere else, that's, that's very, very low locality. If I have a small region that I'm hitting constantly for a whole second, and then I go somewhere else, it doesn't have to be all, it's like one millisecond. And I go somewhere else, that's high locality, okay? Now this is serious. I could have the worst performing allocator in the world. It could be implemented in Java for all I care. But as long as the memory that's allocated is close by for long running systems, I do not care. So if somebody says, oh, I'm going to go write that monotonic allocator in assembly, oh, gosh, whatever, OK? Maximum memory use uh, in use versus total. I explained utilization before. Basically, if I'm repeatedly allocating and freeing, the uh, memory utilization is low. If I'm allocating all the memory, doing something, and getting rid of it, which is a common uh, type of thing to do, then it's got high utilization. When you have these things, utilization in particular, it will tell you what kind of allocator to use, OK? Again, consider int and string, but moving on. The concurrency one is the least inspired. It's basically, thank goodness it's at the end, and there's like three slides. What are we going to do? We're going to do one, one local allocator per thread, see if it does better than the global malloc, right? That's what we're going to do. I want to talk about that a little more when I get there. Um, so at most, one thread has non-zero uh, 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 density. So 
basically there is no contention, or everybody and every thread, all they're doing is contending. And you'll notice there's a strong correlation between contention and allocation density. So these are not orthogonal dimensions by any stretch. So here's the summary, and there's a mnemonic, Divluck the duck. You may think this is funny, but it took me maybe six months to remember the dimension. So if I say Divluck the duck, then I'm good. So I hope you remember Divluck the duck, and we'll go on to analyzing benchmark data. This is the part where I take off my coat because this stuff is gnarly. Oh, shoot. How are we doing? Any, any thoughts so far? Are you getting your money's worth? Okay. All right. I want you to know I stayed up many, many, many hours, and I'm still not done with this talk, but I'm trying. It'll get better. So here's some considerations. We wanted to explore each dimension to observe its effects. That would be great. So what am I going to do? We're going to create a big n-dimensional space. We're going to find the centroid, and we're just going to vary it along each dimension. Yay. Try that. <laughs> That's hard stuff. Can anybody think of what that would look like? Because I'll tell you, we got about five really smart people in my group and we sat down. No. So we settled on four benchmarks for the five dimensions. We at least got one benchmark to check two of them. And we have one benchmark that checks the both sides of locality. So we did some work. Uh, we tried not to assume that we knew what we were talking about. Because people, sometimes they go looking for what they want to find, and they make sure they find it. We explicitly did not do that, so we tried everything. We also decided, the first experiment that I tried, I used powers of 10. Powers of 10 are too coarse. We want to trade off things double and half. So I've got a big system, it's, it's a size 2 to the 21 bytes, okay? Now, the subsystem size is zero. What does that mean? That means it's two to the zero, it's, it's one byte. So if I have a one byte subsystem, it could be one word, but if I have a one byte subsystem and the size of the problem is two to the 21, right, then, then uh, I multiply the two, uh, or excuse me, I take the size of the problem, two to the 21, divide it by one, and I get the number of subsystems. So I have two to the 21 subsystems of size one. Then I have two to the 20 subsystems of size two then two to the 19 subsystems of size three. Two to the three. I'll use integers a lot interchangeably so that it's the, the, the sum of the exponents will add to the problem size. I'll remind you. Um, so this way we can look at different similar relationships and we can look at different sizes. We can look at problems of size two to the 21 and see how they compare to size two to the 25, for example. See that in benchmark two. There's some really cool information in that. Well, I, I will point out, and I'm excited to do it. All right. So things we'll trade off are subsystem size, number of subsystems, and subsystem iterations versus experimental repetitions. So I have to put this out here because we don't want you to think that we just you know, use some no-name brand computer. So we have a real computer. Uh, I'll put this out as well because data is good, and only the last benchmark used more than just a single threaded uh, approach. Okay, we also looked at these things. What are these things? What are they? They're other, other than what? Okay, well, you say standard. No, they are standard. They're implementations of the standard. So malloc is not an implementation of the standard, it's a standard. And these are implementations of malloc. Do you see the difference? So if I write a pooling allocator and I redefine global new to use my pooling allocator, it's a global pooling allocator and it's all good. Okay? I can write my own allocator. I don't have to use malloc. I don't have to use new. and Overwrite it myself. And as we'll find, 
doesn't do any good because these are already the best global allocators that money can buy, that free software can find for you. We can't do any better. We simply can't. This represents, you know, a gazillion man years of research. So global allocators are done. Can't make a better one yourself. Some people say, well, I'll just substitute your, your multi-pool allocator, which I've spent a 10,000th of the time on, that the people who do this for a living, all they do is write one allocator for their whole life. That's not the point. The point is, you know, it's not writing the best allocator, it's knowing when to use it and how. So important. So, these don't matter. So if anybody thinks that they're gonna put in a better new, nah, not gonna happen. All right, so we're gonna look at short-running programs, the kind that build something up, use it a little bit, and get rid of it. Considerations. Initially, we wanted to investigate density. So we focused on allocation and deallocation. We deliberately didn't want um, locality to, to dominate, uh, but we did want to choose, um, I'm one, one thing ahead, we did want to choose useful data structures. And when we said we tried everything, we got some non-useful data structures, and that's okay. We tried some, people sometimes write code that isn't perfect. We still like it to run faster, even if it isn't perfect. So, as I said, we didn't want locality to dominate, otherwise we wouldn't be measuring the, the specific aspect of density, because you have to build it up. We want the buildup to be quick. The access we want to be quick too, but that's a different thing. Later we thought, oh, let's incorporate uh, uh, varying strings. So we chose strings that exceed our short string optimization, so every string was a unique size. So when we use a string, it has high variability. When we use a vector, which is pre-allocated, uh, excuse me, <laughs> has high variability. When we use a vector, um, it's pre-allocated, so the density of allocations there is very low, and also the size. The size, for example, vector, well, uh, if, we're, if we're at a given size, for example, vector of int, ints are all the same size, but the vector is actually one chunk of memory. So we're trying, we're trying to get uh, both sides here at the same time. So that's why we chose those. Um, so here are four data structures. Does anybody see anything here that looks pathologically stupid? Excellent. So let's just talk about these four. So I have a plan for each data structure in this thoughtfully chosen set. I'm going to create the data structure, access it lightly, destroy it, and repeat until I reach the problem size n. Make sense? We chose 2 to the 27th as our problem size, basically because we tried it a few times and that's how much patience we had. So. Notice what we have here. We're going from container size vector from 2 to the 8th, 2 to the 8th, to 2 to the 16th. And that means that the experiment repetitions are going to go down from 19 to 11. Do you get the pattern? I literally had a bazillion slides trying to explain this, and one slide does it. If you just understand this, we're just trading off, right? OK, good. Thank goodness. The results are in absolute runtime in seconds. All right, now before you panic, first of all, you can all see this, right? It's lucid. You, I, look, all these people are scared now. There are a lot of these, there are a lot of numbers. I'm telling you, this is a hard talk. All right, well, I want you to know that I took pity on you. And to really make sure that you had a good experience, uh, I was going to point out that these represent absolute runtimes. You feeling better? No? All right, well, I put some headers up here. What do you think of this? Better? How would a little bit of line, a little lines to help out do some good? Does anybody remember the Wizard of Oz? What happened to Dorothy when she got to Kansas? Yay! Now, what would happen <laughs> if there were a tool that could take each number and turn it into a color where green is small, red is large, and yellow is somewhere in the middle, and everything in between. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that help to try to see if there are some patterns here? Who wants to see that? All right. All right. 
Now take a look at this for a second. This is not a meaningful chart because we have a vector of int. There's only one allocation, and we're looking at density. There's no variation. There's no density at all. And what do we see? The global allocator over here, the two strategies that we started with, not so good. Monotonic, pretty good. Multipool, pretty good. Both, pretty good. What do you think of that? Don't think, it's noise. This is just one allocation. No one's excited, right? What if we look at the next one? What do you expect to see in the next one? What is that? That's vector of string. Has anybody ever created in the history of mankind a vector of string? Take a look at vector of string. What do you think? Is it worth it? It's somewhere around a factor of four and a little. I don't know. See, in games, I know they care about factors of four, but I mean, if we're just doing regular program, we don't care about a factor of four, do we? I don't know. All right, this is an unordered set of int. This is not as exciting. Look, the improvements, you know, they range from 50, I mean, factor of two to factor of six. I'm not making this up. Does anybody think I made this up? If you think I made this up, we'll have a drink outside. Didn't make this up. Okay, here's the fourth one, a set of unordered set of string. An unordered set of string has variability and it has a bunch of moving parts. It has a bunch of nodes in there. So it has the same size chunks and it has strings of different lengths. So it has a little mix, do you see that? And what are we seeing? Factor of two ish. Okay, any questions? Yes. It doesn't show what? Okay, you're right. I didn't. I, I was talking about the, the the big, the big ones. We can go into that. I was going to go to the more complex data structures. We could do that now. Let's do this now. So, depending on whether you use AS1 or AS2. AS1 means I'm going to bake the type in. I'm going to bake it in. The other one is I'm going to access it via a virtual function call. When you bake it in, it's 103. When you access it via virtual function call, it's 120. So there's some overhead there, right? There isn't always. It depends. It depends on whether the compiler de-virtualizes it or not. Turns out that Clang uh, doesn't do such a good job, but GCC, which is what we're using here, does. But there's sometimes when it can't. But now, if you look over here for AS3 versus AS5, we have 5220 for AS3 and 5240. That's just noise. That's the same code, potentially. There's no difference, okay? Now let's look at the wink. Here I have the monotonic if I, if, I, if I use, let's say I don't use the, the, the virtual one, I use just the regular one, 5220 to 5190, I'm getting 0.3 benefit by winking. If I go over to the other side, 5240 to 5120, now at least I got a couple of percent. Sometimes the winking doesn't help much, but sometimes it does. All right, so here are eight data structures. Because we're in a hurry, Somebody pick a data structure that they like and we'll analyze it in detail, then I'm going to move on. Pick a data structure. Who wants to pick a data structure? What, DS12? Everybody agree? You want 10. You want 10? I'll do 10 and 12. How's that? So I'm just going to walk through this so that you can see all of them. I think it's worth the experience. Some of the thoughts, though, um, they're much larger. We want it to be roughly comparable, so we picked an inner size of 2 to the 7. You see this? It still adds up to 2 to the 27 log. And remember, these are exponents of 2. OK, you understand what we're going to do? Keeps things manageable. So here's DS5. Pick your favorite allocator. It isn't going to be global. You 
for see so many numbers so fast? What's the message? Global allocators suck. Oh, I went past yours. All right, let's look at this one. Unordered set of vector of string. That's what Frank wanted. Okay. AS1 is 73, AS2 is 7320, big whoop. 9.41 with the parameter, 9.39 if I wink it out. With the virtual function, 9.34, 8.97 if I wink it out. This suggests that winking for this particular thing helps. That's for monotonic. Multipool, not as good. It's much, it's much slower than, than monotonic. That's very interesting. Why is that? I suspect it has to do with locality, but I'm not sure. Anyway, and the multi-pool and monotonic is somewhere in the middle. This is a particularly bizarre one. I actually don't know what's going on. I'll, I have to go back and look at it. If we go down to something a little bit bigger, here, we have uh, 99.5, 101, so those are comparable. Then we go to monotonic, and it's five times, about five times faster. If we look at monotonic ver uh, versus wink, the wink doesn't help here. With the virtual one, the wink helps a little. And the cost of the virtual is more with, uh, without the wink and less with the wink. So we're in the noise range. It's not a big deal, OK? When you're dealing with, one second, when you're dealing with a factor of five, you know, 0.1% or 1% or even 10% is not the important thing. The factor of five consistently should influence you. Yes, Frank. Awesome. Thank you for saying that. So what, what Frank just said is true. Um, and I, I, I'm on four hours sleep, so it's right. He's very good like this. So the thing about the multipool is it works for small objects, but as soon as the system size is too big for the multi for the uh, uh, for the for the multipool to work, it'll just pass through. Then you're starting to pick up some of this. So this expense is really because it's not doing its work. It's letting the global allocator do it. So if everybody understands that, if I have small objects. The multi-pool will do great. But if I have bigger objects, it won't. And what, what Frank has correctly pointed out is I have a chunk size in the middle of, of already a multiplying factor. So my system size, it isn't, this isn't 2 to the 6th anymore. The element size is really 2 to the 6th times 2 to the 7th, which is 2 to the 13th, which is too big. So he explained it. He has the answer. That is the answer. I, just didn't think about it, and I'm on four hours sleep, so I apologize. But that is the answer. All right, I'm going to go to 11, and I'm going to go to 12. And unordered set of unordered set of string. So, surprise, the global allocator didn't do so well. Who would have thought? The monotonic is the winner. The monotonic backed by the multipool is close, but not quite as good. And the multipool, not so good. And I suspect for similar reasons, because the multipool, a lot of the, 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 the work being done is being done by the global allocator because it can't. OK? It was a great answer. Thank you very much, Frank. That's good. Ah, all right. Questions or discussions? Yes? I have no idea what you just said. Well, well, am I getting into first fit, best fit? Are you talking about the allocation strategy, the implementation? Don't think about that at all. Just think about whether it's monotonic or multipool. Because as soon as you get, I mean, I, I admit that the multipool has a maximum we need to know about. Um, since I have only 15 minutes left, let me, let me I, I'm over time, but I'm not that crazy over time like the first time when I was 70 minutes over. This isn't going to happen. So the second one, this, this is a hard problem. This is showing locality. And so we're going we're to um, simulate concurrent subsystems. And we're going to try to make the uh, uh, setup and teardown go really quickly. 
so that we don't have to, um, uh, so that the locality of access dominates. Now, we ran this thing for a crazy long time, and the first part of this experiment is just to detect whether a local allocator could help us. So the creation plan, basically, rather than read this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build up a system, uh, and I'm going to build up a system of linked lists. So it's going to be a vector of linked lists, and then I'm going to populate each linked list with some system size, some number of links. And then I'm going to have some number of subsystems, and then I'm going to traverse them. And the best way to do this, I think, on the results of this is an initialized uh, data structure. It's also going to tell you what the buildup and teardown time is. Because eventually, we're going to take a ratio of diffused memory access divided by non-diffused memory access, which means we take the good case on the bottom and the bad case on the top, and we look at the degradation due to diffusion. Fun stuff, right? It's not fragmentation. It's diffusion. Memory diffusion. So here's my system of size G. It has a bunch of subsystems of size S. This is the subsystem size. This is the number of subsystems. This is the physical size. Here's my linked list. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push a link on, push another link on, push another link on. Here's my memory. Now, this is where it gets maddening, because to program this in PowerPoint, you have to learn a lot, right? But I know how to do it now. Then a new system comes along, and guess what? The memory color is different. Why? Because that system is a different subsystem. Now, while you can have a global allocator that's very smart and do thread local stuff, as soon as you use a thread pool and there's no affinity, that whole thing goes out the window. So global allocators try to be very smart about that, but when you don't have threads assigned to subsystems, how do you know what the subsystem is? The answer is you don't, unless you're a human being and have a local allocator assigned to that subsystem. You'll probably see a pattern here. Does anybody see a pattern? Why did all the memory come in in order? Why didn't it get dispersed throughout everything? Because the system is new. There is nothing going on there so you just keep asking for more memory, you keep getting more memory. Now we're not going to allocate any more memory, and this is the part that I would have liked to show, but I unfortunately ran out of time, so I'll do it next time. We're going to traverse the system, and then we're going to repeat. So rather than explain it, let's traverse the system. I access the first element in the list, the second, the third, the fourth. First, second, third, fourth. Next list, because I'm iterating twice. Then I'm going to do it again. Then I'm going to go here, and then I'm going to let it take over. So this is what's going to happen ad nauseum, so we can time the access. And if you notice, there's a repeat count. I'm going to repeat this experiment a gazillion times. So this is where I get some coffee. Oh, You get the idea this runs for hours, hours, hours. OK. So the shuffle plan. This is the plan. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go along to each thing. I'm going to take one off and push it onto another one at random. And I'm going to do that until I've ex exhausted one round through the list. And the result of this is going to be a shuffled system. So what does that mean? So I didn't have time to draw this. I really regret that. But if I were going to draw this, what I would do here is I would take a link off of this, and I would put it somewhere else. And what would happen over here is one of those colors, the green one, would go blue, and then it would turn into whatever color I decided to link it onto. I would do that for each one. And after one iteration, it would look like a homogeneous mix. And after two iterations, it would be a homogeneous mix. OK, that's what I'm trying to tell you. So we're a little short on time, so I'm just going to, the idea is we're going to, we're going to shuffle the thing either way, but we're going to measure it access before shuffling and access after shuffling. So the same amount of work is being done. The only difference is the memory access pattern. That's it, OK? We're going to create what is effectively a ratio of diffused access 
new access, access before the system is churned up, okay? So subsystem size is gonna range from zero to seven. Number of subsystems is gonna range from seven to zero. In this case, this is my first experiment, I use powers of 10, my mistake. Okay, remember this is all powers of 10 for this one experiment only. This is the curve I came up with, curve, surface. This, this axis right here is the number of times I shuffle it, and this here is the subsystem size. The more subsystems I have, or the bigger the subsystem, the fewer subsystems I have. So there's one dimension that we trade off. So here, this is one byte subsystems, and I have 10 million of them. This is, I have one subsystem of size 10 million. All right. The temporal locality, by the way, the number of iterations on this one was 10. So I accessed, instead of two times, accessed it 10 times. This is a heat map that makes it much clearer what's going on in that curve. The idea is, as I go this way, as I shuffle more and more, there's more and more diffusion. Before I shuffle, there's no difference between accessing before and after shuffling if you don't shuffle at all. If you shuffle one time through, you'll notice that the difference in access is huge. Do you see those numbers? And then, if you look at the difference between shuffling once and shuffling twice, it's not that much. Okay, and then you can keep looking, and we're just gonna settle on five from now on. So anytime we do this experiment, you see one of those beautiful surfaces, it means we shuffled the deck five times. Okay. Uh, okay, now, what does this mean? This is saying I have one subsystem. If I have one subsystem and I pick something off at random and push it back on, I'm just rotating it. So you would expect that to be all one, it's no different. But the very interesting thing, notice that if I go for 10 subsystems, one tenth the size, that I get this very crazy row. It's huge. Can anybody tell me why? Why is that row, do you think, important? Yes? What happened, this is what happened. For some reason, right around there, the difference between shuffled and non-shuffled, right? When it's shuffled, I get one data item per cache line. When it's not shuffled, I get eight. Do you see what I'm saying? This is the L1 cache size that fits before it's shuffled and doesn't fit after. That's what it is. How cool is that? All right, we'll see that again. I'll prove that to you. This is a lot of fun. So anyway, this is the curve again. I just want to show it to you one more time. Are there any questions here? All right, next one. What local allocation strategy should we use? Monotonic, multi-pool, combination? What do you think? Why monotonic? When we do the shuffle, we're, we're churning a lot. We're deleting and adding, deleting and adding, deleting and adding when we do the shuffle. If we shuffled enough, we would exhaust all of memory. I'm suggesting any of these is a good choice because the multi-pool will be in front and when you give it back, it'll give it to you quickly. Th that's okay. All right, now what we're gonna do is pick a problem of size two to the 21 and we're gonna trade off back to powers of two, number of iterations versus number of repetitions. So if the number of iterations is eight, that's two to the eight, that's 256, that's high locality, and we're gonna go down here, and the number of repetitions of the experiment, so by the way, I picked, to all, full disclosure, I picked N equals 32, I'm not sure if it was exactly 32, but it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, it's a ratio of the two, and we're taking off setup costs. So it's about 32, but don't hold me to it. All right, did I do that already? I think I might have a duplicate slide. This curve is my really awesome, it's an awesome curve. What this is showing is, is that as the locality, this is high temporal locality, as the number of accesses in the iterations uh, gets smaller and smaller, the ratio, the cost, because if you're accessing something over and over and over, you at least pull in your local stuff into cache and you get some use out of it. The back line, the one in the back over here, is that same level, it's around, it's around two to the 18th. That's where it maximizes. That big peak along the back is where the, the, the diffused memory doesn't fit in cache, but the non-diffused memory does. This is really, I'm telling you, this is, this, this is so good. Now, I want you to just watch this happen. Um, this is the heat map. 
There's a little glitch that goes on here. When you have subsystems of size one, funny things happen that I can't explain. It's unlikely that that would be the case. The bottom two are anomalous. This in particular is really bizarre. So if you take this out, you mask it off, the heat map doesn't change on this graph. That's fine. This is a graph of 2 to the 25th instead of 2 to the 21st. So it's 16 times bigger. That's important. The thing to realize is that the big difference occurs at the same subsystem size. It's not three off of the top. It's at precisely the same subsystem size, which is proof, in my opinion, at least good evidence, that it's tied to the hardware and that it doesn't matter how big the program is because once the program completely exceeds the L1 cache, it's over anyway. And it's just that little window of a factor of 10 where the subsystem fits in. OK. Now, if we take this one off, watch the color change. Everybody looking? You can see, if you take off that little noise, which we were able to repeat, OK. So you see that there's that, that, that band. You see that? This is, this is physical locality, small subsystems. This is temporal locality, lots of accesses. And as you diverge, what do you need? You need a local allocator. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to put a local allocator in here. Notice the scale. Do you remember this scale? Look at this scale. 30 difference. Hold on. 2.52. 2. So diffusion goes from 30 to, at worst, 2.5. Look at this. Right around here. At this particular region, the ratio of having an allocator to not having an allocator, not having an, excuse me, not having an allocator to having an allocator. Because these numbers are bigger than one, right? Did I say that right? Yes. So that's not what I'm saying. This is with a low, I'm sorry. Delete what I just said. This experiment is before diffusion and after diffusion measuring with an allocator. We're saying that if after I run the system for a while, the degradation is as bad as two and a half times instead of 10 times. That's what I'm trying to say. I apologize, I'm tired. But you get the idea. This is the second measure. And now we're going to do it again with size 25. And we'll see the same pattern right around here. You'll see this is the worst place. The allocators don't help as much here relative to not having. They still, they still, OK. They definitely help because the scale is completely different. All right, now without versus with, this is the, the test. This is the difference between if I have an alloc, this is the ratio of ratios. This is how much better it is to have an allocator. OK, so let's look at that. So at that key region, which keeps the locality, it's an order of magnitude in that band. And if I mask this, it highlights it a little better. That red band, that's where you must, must have an allocator. This actually is worth money. This is serious. This is going to be public, too, so you can use this. This is the size 25. Check this out. I'm going to get rid of this again. Notice the band is still at 18. It's tied to the physical hardware at 18. This is so cool. Isn't it cool? Come on. This beats the heck out of, oh, I want to optimize that thing. I want to yeah, use a template. I'm going to compile it in, and it's going to be awesome. Nonsense. Questions or discussion? All right, I'm going to have to rip through the last of this because I'm over time real quick. Uh, we, we ran a whole bunch of tests. We found that the one that came with GCC was better. It used to be that those were good, and then guess what? GC Malloc, I mean, uh, uh, GCC took it and made it their own, and now theirs is that. All right, so with the utilization, I mean, the bottom line is we built the thing up. Rather than go through this, because I am going over, at least it's not as bad as last time. What we're going to do, I'll just show you the results here. Uh, we're not going to wink things out now, because what we're doing is we're building up to some level of usage, and then we're deleting, adding, deleting, and adding, till we get to some total, and then we're deconstructing the whole thing. That's it. So um, it turns out we expected some trouble with monotonic, and we got it. 
So here's the small size. This is t equals 2 to the 30. And you notice as the size gets bigger, right? As the size gets bigger, um, we're having problems with monotonic, even when it's backed by a multipool, because once the size gets larger, as Frank pointed out, then it's just it's pushing through. But if it pushes through to the monotonic, the monotonic will, because we're long running, allocating, deallocating, allocating, deallocating. And the, 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 the basic point, oh, and I should mention one other thing. AS1 is real time in seconds. Everything else is a percent relative to AS1. And all of the colors this time are per row. The colors are, 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 are per row rather than for the entire graph. That's true of the next one as well. So if you look at this, what's going to happen is at some point we're going to exhaust all of memory with the monotonic, and it's just going to fail, and that's it. There's nothing more to be said. So if you have something with low utilization and it's long running, don't do that. All right. So you get the idea. Uh, and the last one is the least interesting, multi-threading. What's the real point? We just wanted to compare a local allocator with the uh, uh, malloc-free style of things, and it knows about threads. So what we're going to do is we're going to just create a bunch of threads and go through it. And some additional consideration, the density is high. All right, so let's take a look. So here I have the number of iterations is 15, and the size of the chunk being allocated is 6, and I'm going to try it between 1 and 8 threads. And there is no surprise here. If you use a multi-pool that's unsynchronized in your, in, in your thread, instead of using new, it's going to be faster by some multiple. And it's constant, which indicates to me that they are doing thread-specific allocation. So I'm just going to show you the numbers. It generally shows that if you have a multi-pool in there, you're doing well. If you use monotonic, you know, your, 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 uh, your allocations, your deallocations are no ops. And I'll just put them all up here, and you'll see that things are changing a little bit. We're trying different uh, numbers of instructions. The idea is the same. Throughout, you're getting a factor of four. OK. This is one little teaser. It says from the internet, and I, I didn't uh, have time to put it into a slide, but I'll just mention, you've heard of fault sharing, right? If you try to parallelize this algorithm, and you do it badly, you'll wind up getting two things on the same cache line that are in different threads. One of, and you get this kind of behavior. As the number of threads go up to do a fully parallelizable thing, you don't get the performance boost you expect, which should be totally linear. Guess what you can use to make sure that you don't get two separate subsystem memory things on the same cache line? Can anybody guess? Yes, local alligators. So then you get this. All right, now there was a problem. Forgive me, I'm going over a little bit. This is the first time I ever gave the talk. I think five minutes, I hope, if you can stand it. I know lunch is out there, I feel bad. But if anybody needs to leave, that's fine. I think you already pretty much know the idea. Um, there was a problem. One of our scripts that put the data together reversed. Guess what, this is awesome. Monotonic and multipool. The whole thing, all four columns. Oh my goodness. We couldn't explain it, so what did we do? We got this very brilliant person. Uh, his name is Graham Blaney. He was a co-op student at Bloomberg a couple of years ago. And I just asked him, hey, listen, I want you to do something. It was no big deal. The five of us worked on this for like, I don't know, half a year. Could you just uh, repeat all the experiments? And by the way, don't look at the code. Don't look at the code. Just, I'll tell you what I did, and, and you just go do it again from scratch. OK, sure. He's in school right now. He went and he actually did that and produced a paper comparable to ours, and found the bug. Uh, so this is the separate effort that we uh, talked about. He also came up with, not a bad guy, a new dimension, a measure of the potential. This is fragmentability F, a measure of the potential of a subsystem uh, uh, allocated memory to become diffused throughout physical memory as a result of the interface of other subsystems memory allocation. If a subsystem is fragmentable, i.e. other subsystems are present in the process and the subsystem allocates more than one chunk of memory, f is greater than zero. So a vector of int is not fragmentable. But a vector of string, where the strings are long, is. That is a very interesting thing to think about. We hired him, needless to say. <laughs> OK, he came and spoke at the Standards Committee. 
And as it turns out, uh, this and the monotonic and multipool allocator specifications are now part of C17. These are the references. You really want to look at the last one because everything, most of what I said here, is actually in great detail in a 70 page paper, is analyzed and discussed, including Graham's paper. So, are memory allocators worth it? You be the judge. Uh, there are a few qualitatively different cases. One of them is to improve performance. Take a look at that when I get my last drink of coffee before I call it a day. Then, to put objects where you want to put them. Then, to write some code in a reasonable, professional way. Okay, this is the quiz. I promised there'd be a quiz. Anybody that gets the right answer, I think I have to buy a drink. But I can't, it has to be one drink per answer. So I can't give you all a drink for each answer. Even me, can't do that. What goes here? I have a program that's large and long running and subsystems are accessed disproportionately often giving us a high, uh, 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 excuse me, giving us, yes, giving us the potential to achieve a higher locality. That's what I wanna say. So if you look in the, the box that doesn't have A or B, this is a small program, and it, it's completely homogenous. It's just, there's nothing there. This is a global allocator. Now let's look at the other one. It's a big program, and it's time multiplexed. What do you use? Look out. Lo lo I'll buy you a drink. You use a local allocator. What if it's a small program, but it's still time multiplexed? All right. You might want to use a local. You might. I didn't look. There's no exclamation mark. It's not in bold. You might. What if it's a huge monolithic behemoth program that has absolutely no locality whatsoever in it? What do you do? All right. Now suppose the same thing, big or small program, but they exhibit high memory utilization. Okay, it's a small program, it's low memory utilization. So I'm just allocate, deallocate, allocate, deallocate. Little program done. What do I use? Inbox number one. Global allocator, we don't care. That is a pool allocator. It's a general purpose allocator. What about here? What if it is high utilization? Big system, high utilization. All the memory is in use at once at one point. What? What? Say it. I heard, I heard that somewhere from this area. All right. Use a local monotonic allocator because the memory gets to the actual size and doesn't keep going back and forth. Okay, what about over here? It's a small program but it does have a, 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 a high utilization. We saw it, benchmark one. You might want to use a monotonic allocator because you can, you don't have to. You're trading off the amount of effort you have to put in to the performance that you want. That's the trade off. What about over here? It's a huge system and I have low memory utilization. Local multi-pool allocator. I have concurrency and I have a long-running program. What if I don't? What if it's a small program and there's no concurrency? Right. What about over here? So I do have concurrency. It's a huge program. Use a local allocator. What about over here? So this is saying, I do have concurrency, but it's a small program. Maybe you do that. It's a big program. I don't have any concurrency. It's a big program. There's going to be some reason to use local allocators in a big program. The point is that most of the time, there's an opportunity to use local allocators. So the performance impact can be substantial. Uh, Notice that in every benchmark, local allocators gave some advantage. For long-running pro uh, programs, 
the improvement over not using them can be as much as an order of magnitude. And the overhead for using a virtual function call is slim to none, and it really depends on the compiler and the, the, the use, but is completely dominated by locality. So final thoughts, I'm going to sort of read this. This is the conclude, entire conclusion of the paper. Object level control over memory allocation uh, is intrinsic to C++ and must always be so if we hope to maintain this language supremacy as the best programming high-level systems language. Supporting object-specific memory allocation is admittedly an added burden, exacerbated by an initially uh, difficult-to-use model, which is finally being addressed in C++17 by polymorphic memory resources any future incarnation of SDL should incorporate the lessons elucidated here. And remember this. And? So just remember, F divlock. Okay? But F divlock, but don't mess with the doc. You won't forget this, right? All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it.